title of the talk today is Towards a New Future of Mobility. Uh, and this is the second talk that's being filmed as part of a Lighthouse Talks collaboration uh, between Dezine and Bentley, um, part of a three-year collaboration between us that will see Bentley working with Dezine to support and inspire the next generation of design talent, as well as champion design excellence and sustainable solutions. I'm joined by a great panel of experts today. Um, on my left, I have Robin Page. Uh -huh. He's the design director at Bentley Motors. Uh, next to him, we have Kirsty Dias, uh, Managing Director of Priestman Good. Um, next to her is Carla Jakeman. She's the Head of Automated Transport at TRL. And then finally, to her left, Eve Beha, Founder and Principal Designer at Fuse Project. I wanted to ask you all a question to begin with around mobility and transport design and the rapid transformations that we're seeing. Which, which changes, maybe present, and future do you think are proving kind of most transformative? Well, I think the electric EVs have been transformative. I'm um, one of the very few people I can say that has driven the same electric car for 10 and a half years uh, continuously. Believe it or not, the car has never been in the garage. I didn't even change the brakes. Um, so my only costs were really the tires. And that is something that um, is, is truly transformative. I think one of the biggest transformations is the consideration of human factors when it comes to transport. So rather it, it just being for a 95 percentile, percentile male, um, we're building in accessibility um, challenges for visible and invisible from the beginning in new technologies like autonomous vehicles. So they're not bolt on like they have been in the past. So we're a lot more aware of some of the human factor challenges. And I think that that being inbuilt into some of the design of different transport infrastructure and systems, um, I think is pretty, um, pretty great, pretty transformative. Yeah. I would absolutely agree with that. I also think there's, you know, what we've seen in, in recent years is tackling kind of first and last mile. So really thinking about, you know, the shared scooters and the shared bikes to really help you enter public transport systems. But I do think, you know, in all our conversations, it's really important to kind of understand the context that you're operating in, because there's a, a huge difference between creating a, a multimodal transport system in a city than there is in a kind of rural environment. And understanding the needs of uh, all of those users is is really important. I'll probably hark back a little bit to the transformation of the electrification, um, because it's not just about the um, the the new technology and the platform. It's a, a a big chance to do a step change from normal automotive design into electrification, but beyond that, into then the technology that you get embedded around it. Um, also, the experience to the customer. Um, and, and it opens up this kind of box of design opportunities that's a, a brilliant chapter that you can really challenge the industry and move things forward. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about the this sort of liberation, I suppose, of mm. electric vehicles in a design typology sense. How would you envisage that's going to change and, and are you trying to change it yourselves, Eve? I think the opportunities are vast. I mean, um, when you look at even just safety systems, the things that we can do now with, um, with AI, with uh, ADA systems. I've become a partner um, uh, with Fuse Project in Tello. Um, it's a new uh, pickup truck or a new truck company. And we're focused on high efficiency, high range, high performance, but small vehicles. And um, what we're able to do is to take about 350 mile range battery, put it together differently, which, um, which, which really allows you to have now high performance in a, in a small lightweight vehicle, which um, you can park in cities. I mean, if you, if you think back to, there's a, almost a rule book of, of designing a car from the past, which was a lot about the bottom of the eight post to the center of the wheel. And that dimension gave you what we call the premium proportion because it's about the size of the engine in front of you. Now, you don't need an engine, so we take that away. And the proportion that then becomes important is the one in between the wheels because that is where the power pack now is. So you start to see a trend of wheelbases getting longer. 
Then the next uh, influence you get is aerodynamics because that's directly relation to range. And um, so that starts to automatically transform proportions into the industry. So then it turns into kind of shorter overhangs, longer rear overhangs, lower cabins, because now you've got a flat floor and you've got a bigger cabin for the whole length of the car. Then you can start to play around with how you use that interior space. Electrification doesn't just, it's not just a powertrain, it's an actual change in philosophy of how to design cars. Let's um, move on to autonomous vehicles. Where are we at? Tell us what you're up to. Oh, we're on the journey. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a lot more complicated, I think, than, um, than we probably originally thought. But uh, the progress that we are making, um, we are doing some amazing testing. We've had vehicles driving around London without a driver. There's a safety driver, but um, we're, we're making big progress. And it's, it's not just on passenger vehicles as well. It's also around uh, construction, mining, agriculture. So, and, and they're actually probably going to be the areas where um, autonomous vehicles will be seen first, to be honest, because there's no pesky passengers in all of that regulation. So it's a lot easier um, in those industries. But I mean, you're independent from any car brands. So, so what, what specifically are you doing? The main thing that we do is the safety case development. So we will work with other projects who are putting vehicles on the roads to work with them with, through their safety case so we can make sure that it meets uh, the regulations and the guidance as much as possible. Because one of the challenges we've got is around public perception. And a lot of people will think autonomous vehicles, it's all a bit Star Trek and, you know, it's not going to affect me in my lifetime, but it will do. It already is. So we've got to change that public perception and we need people to, to feel that they're safe and that, that all of these self safety considerations have been taken care of. I think it's just the, the journey, as you're saying, it's a stepping stone of technology. The, the way to get there is to continuously update the pilot assist technologies um, and collecting data. And then gradually it will come into then you realize you're in autonomous uh, technology levels it won't be this kind of leap. It'll be more of a stepping stone uh, okay. and that will grow in the industries. Well, what I find amazing is we're, we're, we're seeing the future being created literally in our streets. I, I live in San Francisco and there's probably 15 plus companies testing, um, mm -hmm. testing their vehicles and testing their systems there at the same time. Can, can we talk about trains? I know sure. this is, this is Kirsty, <laughs> your studio has been doing amazing work with train travel for for a long time. We've been talking about electrification. That's nothing new to trains. Yeah, electrification is common in train, you know, in the train world, but there are still parts of the country which, you know, are yeah. waiting for electrification. And that's really important because I think we can see through the growth of any public transport system kind of historically that socio and economic growth comes from strong public transport infrastructure. So we're seeing, I think, great transformation in places like North America, but it's, it's slow because it's a very different system. In Europe, we're about to see the launch of our night jet service for Austrian Rail, OBB, that's gonna come at the end of November. And that is truly gonna kind of revolutionize travel from country to country in mainland Europe. It's gonna be a compelling alternative to flying. So it's a very exciting time. When I was at Innovate UK, the Connected Places Catapult, they did some um, brilliant, uh, they did a brilliant innovation using VR headsets for designers so that they could see what it's like to walk around a train station if you have glaucoma or another, uh, there was various different eye, eye disorders. So it enables the designers to really think about some of these um, concerns more when they're designing train stations or, or um, any kind of transport hub. So that's some work that, is that some tools you're using in your studio, Kirsty? Yeah, we're kind of using VR um, kind of a great deal. One of the really interesting uh, uses of it is for, you know, people, for example, with uh, neurodiversity issues to kind of anticipate and plan journeys so that they feel much more comfortable and confident when they're embarking on a journey, nowhere to go, nowhere to find help. And it's, yeah, it's, it's much more reassuring. What's interesting is the technologies we're using, the tools we have as uh, designers, is that you can create these experiences so that you can actually go into someone else's uh, viewpoint, experiencing it through the eyes of someone else and then coming up with solutions to tackle those, those issues. So 
are you doing any work with sort of ethnographic studies any of you to understand what cultural you know understand the cultural differences what people want in one side of the world might be different from the other side of the world certainly what's interesting is studying especially the next generation uh, of, of new customers the obvious ones are you know they're very interested in sustainability and the other one is that they want connectivity <clears throat> and they want that seamless yes they want the technology but they don't want it as a technology overload so it's a lot about taking things away so we create an experience that's not frustrating i mean we've all been there when you get into a rental car and it's like okay where do i start with this so it is about stripping it away so that it's actually a nice experience um and i think there's so much in traditionally in the car industry that has been about putting more bells and whistles in there, putting more complexity. And for me, the key to success, to mainstream success, is taking things away rather than acting like uh, technologists who are, you know, always want to add things in there. Mm -hmm. um, so if you remove complexity from um, these types of products, Mm. you get a much wider adoption. I would just like to ask about infrastructural change. Uh, a lot of this is reliant on, on widespread infrastructural change. Is, is political will slowing us down, do you think, in the adoption of, uh, of these technologies? Yes. Robin? I think the, the important one is the infrastructure um, to, to really embrace electrification. You know, this is a great journey to be on and we know we're doing the right thing. What we need is the governments to actually put the infrastructure in and keep building it so that everyone is very comfortable with driving anywhere they want to, to go. I'll just use one number. Uh, pickup trucks in the US represent, believe it or not, 10.5% of all emissions. Talking about, you know, domestic, electricity, industrial, et cetera, et cetera. So pushing, enabling change you can make double digit progress in terms of, mm -hmm. of carbon emissions. If you enable, if you support, if you create the infrastructure needed, uh, progress happens much faster and the consumer is much more likely to adopt uh, these new technologies. Let's have a question. Just picking up on your comment earlier about the change, I think you call it the premium proportions um, mm -hmm. when you were talking about the, the changing proportions of car just thinking about what electrification means for luxury in, in the future what uh, electrification brings is the, is the quietness and the refinement and and the more space in the cabin the petrol engine's gone and suddenly now you've got a different experience you've got this quieter experience you can reconnect with all the senses in the car so i think it opens up in terms of the luxury sector it really, it really is a good thing. I mean, it's the silent sports car, it's, it's the luxury limousine. And I don't think we lose the traditional proportions. That's probably what you're hinting at is that certainly with Bentley, this, the graceful lines can still exist, but the interior space can grow. You know, we're gonna get rid of a lot of petrol fueled cars and vehicles, airplanes, buses, trains, we mentioned earlier. W what are your takes on retrofitting? It's been about 20 years that I'm asked this question, why do we need another chair? When I designed the, the sail chair for Herman Miller, um, it uses less than half of the carbon footprint in terms of materials, uh, production uh, than a standard chair. So you can choose as an industry to continue to produce the materials and the, and the, um, and the goods that use 50%, 60%, 70% more energy and more carbon, or you can switch to the new technologies um, that, uh, that allow you to reduce it uh, greatly. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for retrofitting existing cars to electric, I think uh, especially good looking ones and vintage ones. But overall, I would say as an industry, uh, moving forward is a way to significantly cut down on, on uh, both emissions and, and materials. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Robin, Kirsty, Carla, and Eve. Thank you. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs>